sexual selection is the force of natural selection that acts on a population because of mate choice and the necessity to find a mate. And often it is more pronounced on one part of the population than the other. It can be broadly divided into two classes, intersexual selection and intrasexual selection. So intersexual selection is when there is strong natural selection on one part of the population because the opposite sex determines what they like. So let me play a video here and then we'll talk about it some more. So this video is uh, from a nature show and it shows the mating habits of a bird of paradise. And there are many, many different uh, birds of paradise and this is just one of many different species. That's the male, the black one, and the brown one in the background is the female. Those clicking sounds you hear are its feathers being snapped together somewhat like you snap your fingers together. So the birds of paradise are a particularly good example of intersexual selection. However, it's common in many birds. And in intersexual selection, one sex is making the decision about whether or not to mate. And the other sex is doing everything in their power to try and convince them to mate. And it's nearly always the males that have the strongest force of sexual selection on them. So it's the males that have the bright color. It's the males that have the elaborate feathers or the dance or the larger size than uh, closely related species. So in intersexual selection, the females are the ones with the majority of the power. They make the decision and males do everything they can to try and convince the females to mate with them. The second type of sexual selection is called intrasexual selection. And intrasexual selection, all of the decisions and power, at least majority of it, is within a single sex. So rather than males competing for the approval of the females, males compete among themselves. They fight, they uh, wrestle, sometimes indirectly, they will compete with one another for access to the females. And so the males are determining based on the criteria that are instinctual and within the species, but it's the males that are determining who gets to mate with the females. We talked in the last lecture about elephant seals and them fighting for a little stretch of beach real estate that then enables them to mate with the females. That's a form of intrasexual selection. Here's another form of intrasexual selection, which is common among species of mammals. Again, this is taken from a nature show. This is uh, bighorn sheep in North America. Now notice that sexual dimorphism is present. The males are larger in size and have much larger horns and reinforced skulls. And
sexual dimorphism is a sign that sexual selection is working in the population. And when we look at sexual dimorphism, it's almost always more pronounced in the males. So in these mountain sheep, there's strong intrasexual selection. The males compete with one another. However, there is still some intersexual selection, although it's much weaker. The females do still have some choice. So it's not either or. You can have elements of both. However, many species show one more strongly pronounced than the other. And so as we look at this, whether it's intersexual selection and one sex is choosing the qualities of the other sex, or intrasexual selection, where one sex is competing within their own little subset of the population for access to the other sex. This sexual selection is nearly always strongest on the males. There are very, very few species where it's the females that show pronounced sexual selection. And so then the question arises, why? Why do we see this pattern where it's nearly always the males that are exhibiting the, uh, let me get back here, uh, I went too far. It's nearly always the males that are exhibiting the strong uh, sexual selection. Um, I'm going to play a short audio clip from a musical. The musical is called The Scarlet Pimpernel, and I want to give you just a little bit of background before I play the clip. And it illustrates in kind of a humorous way and this strong sexual selection on the males and makes an argument that this is in uh, humans also. And we do see some uh, sexual selection in humans, although it's probably fairly weak and is much weaker now than it was in the past. But the background of this, uh, the Scarlet Pimpernel is essentially like Batman during the French Revolution. He's a rich English aristocrat who is going about saving people from the terror in France, the guillotine, and all of the horrors that are going on during the French Revolution. And to do this, he has a disguise. That's why I kind of say it's like Batman. And he's disguised himself as a rich uh, kind of, uh, I guess the term would be a fop. That was the term back then. That uh, Basically, he doesn't care about anything except looking pretty and going to parties and uh, having all the latest fashions. And so in this clip, Scarlet Pimpernel, as part of his disguise, is trying to convince the King of England that he needs to dress better, and he's using an argument from biology. He's basically saying, in nature, we see all of these males that are beautiful and have a decoration, and humans should be no different. So here's the clip. We'll just play a portion of it. I don't know which line is better, be the king of beasts in pastels, or that is why the Lord created man. But essentially, this is an argument between intrasexual selection, which is what the king was arguing for, right? He said man's job is to uh, 
defend the cave, be big and strong, and fight off uh, rivals. And the Scarlet Pimpernel is saying, no, you know, it's intersexual selection, although he's not using those terms. We're saying we need to dress up, we need to be beautiful, and, and uh, that will attract uh, women. Um, and now we can make an argument which one is more pronounced, although, and we do have some sexual selection in uh, humans, uh, not as pronounced as many other species, but we still haven't answered this question, right? Why is it strongest on the males? And the answer is essentially because of the definition of what makes a male and a female. And we can think about it from the perspective of game theory, or perhaps even like an economic exchange. Females have the limiting resource. They put lots of effort and energy into each individual embryo. Just by definition, that's what makes a female. And this is especially so in mammals, but it's true in birds and, and every other species to some extent or another. Each embryo has a huge amount of investment from the females, but there's a minimal amount of investment necessary from the males. And so whatever the system is, males have to work harder. Basically, if we think of an egg and a sperm as an exchange, sperm are plentiful and cheap, eggs are rare and costly, and so there needs to be a lot more effort and incentive on the side of the males. And that is expressed when it occurs, either as intersexual selection, where males compete and look beautiful and have the right song and dance and colors to entice the females to mate with them, or males fight amongst themselves and then have access to the females. And those two different forms and combination of those have evolved because males have a much more plentiful resource sperm. And in many species, the minimal amount of effort is simply convincing a female to mate with you and then they're done. And there's little parental care and energy investment after that from the male. But the females, by definition, have to have much more investment if they're going to be successful. And in some species, it's very, very extreme. In other species, it's adapted to be a little less so. So there are several different patterns that we notice when we have intersexual selection. The first is something we're going to call direct benefits. Now, these are not mutually exclusive. We can have one or two or three, or there can be overlaps and combinations of these. So we're going to give you good examples where it's very strong uh, pattern of one of them, but just realize that other things can be present even in these species. Direct benefits means the female gets some fitness benefit other than just mating. She needs to mate to have offspring, which is part of fitness, but she gets something else. In the species here on the right, these are species of insects that are predatory. The male will find a prey item, a, f a, a fly in this case, some food, and he will present it to the female as an enticement to mate. And so females very often will not allow a male to mate with her unless he has what amount essentially amounts to a bribe. And so that's a direct benefit. She gets a meal out of it. In some species, the female gets protection from danger or maybe even protection from harassment from other males, and that's a benefit. And so in those cases, females tend to choose the larger, stronger male with the behavior that looks like he will stay around and protect her. And again, we can argue whether or not direct benefits happen in the human race. I think in some cases they do. They're probably more pronounced in some cultures than others. The second thing we see is the good genes, sometimes called the good genes hypothesis. And good genes is when a female chooses a mate because he's healthy and strong. And so females will assess a mate. And so in order for this to work, there needs to be an honest signal. And an honest signal is something where the male is communicating with the female, either visually or chemically, and basically advertising how healthy and fit and strong he is. And if males can fake that signal, if a weak male can give off the same signal, then this whole good genes hypothesis won't work because females are unable to distinguish between males that are healthy and males that are less so based on the signal. And so the systems that maintain themselves are signals that are very difficult to fake. So in this species of fish, this bright red coloration is a signal that the male is giving off saying, look how healthy I am. And this signal is very, very hard to maintain. It's energetically expensive. So if males are sick or if they're not as, as strong as uh, they could be, they will be unable to make this red color because their resources are going into uh, helping them to be uh, healed from their disease to recover from that or just staying alive and getting enough food. And only the healthiest male can display the red color. 
size is often off, also an honest signal because it's hard to fake size. Although sometimes some adaptations have come around to um, do that and males will take advantage of these but then the healthy males do too and they still look a little bit or bigger. So one example that I often see down here in South Texas is um, grackles, these big black birds that sometimes we get in just huge numbers. When the male is trying to convince the female to mate with him, he will puff up his feathers and look really, really big and imposing. And uh, bigger males do it better, and so it's still somewhat of an honest signal, even though if you had long fe feathers and a small size, you might be able to fake it a little bit. So again, good genes are only being able, this hypothesis of good genes being able to, to convince a female to mate with you is only possible if the male can honestly convey uh, his health status. And sometimes when intersexual selection is at play, we get runaway sexual selection, which is when, when female choice just drives mate phenotype, the male's phenotype just drives it to an extreme, sometimes so much so that it puts other areas of male fitness at risk. So mating, finding a mate, reproducing is part of fitness, but so is staying alive and avoiding predators or having a healthy immune system or being large enough that you can make your way in your environment. So this is an example of runaway sexual selection in the widow bird, W-I-D-O-W. And in the widow bird, the tail is three or four times the length of the body, and females really, really prefer males with longer tails. And they've done experiments where they've taken males that have short tails. They artificially enhance them so that the females will mate with them. So basically, they give them a fake tail. And the offspring are just as healthy, just as strong. There doesn't seem to be any benefit for the females to choose a mate with a really, really long tail. So it's not really a good gene scenario. Um, but the females just really like it. That's a mutation, a preference in the females that has been pushed to the extreme. And so to distinguish the good genes model and runaway selection, we might need to do experiments and measure fitness in, in criteria other than just whatever trait the females like. The um, male peacock with its really, really long tail is also as an example of runaway selection. Although there is some element of a good genes model going on, they could be mixed because maybe only the very, very healthiest males can have that large um, tail or whatever fancy song or dance that the females choose. And if only the healthiest males can do it, then it's more of a good genes model. But if both healthy and weak m males can do it, and we're going to measure healthy and other areas of fitness health, ability to survive. If males that are very healthy and really able to survive in other areas uh, have long tails or have the trait that the females like, and the weak males do also, then it's a runaway selection model. Okay, the fourth one that we're going to talk about that we see in intersexual selection is sensory bias. And sensory bias is when females have a strong choice for something in the males, but it has not yet evolved in the male population. And the way that we determine whether or not sensory bias applies to a group of organisms is we map the origin of the female preference and then the origin of the male characteristic that they prefer on a phylogeny. And if the female preference is present before the male characteristic, then there's sensory bias. Here's an example in toads. In these toads, the preference for a, a certain type of a call they're calling is here the chuck, which is like a very short staccato call that the males make. And that preference among the female evolves uh, anciently, but the call itself only arose because, remember, it's a random mutation. It only arose in a subcategory. So if they play the chuck call in this P. coloratum, a species, the females will just go crazy and they'll mate with males, but none of the males make that call, even though it would be a benefit to them. There's another example of sword tails in fish. These are sometimes kept in aquariums, uh, freshwater aquariums, where the preference for this really long extended call evolved anciently, but only a few species do the males actually possess it. And if you art artificially enhance the males in the species that don't have sword tails, but you give them fake sword tails, it's really a huge advantage for those males. And so this again demonstrates the random nature of mutations that even if something is good, it's not going to be selected for unless it pops up by a mutation. 
Okay, so now on to intrasexual selection. And again, intrasexual selection is very common in mammals. We looked at the elephant seal example in a previous discussion. We showed you the video of those bighorn sheep, but we see it in many, many mammals, including humans to some extent. When we have males that are much larger than the females, that's usually a sign that there's some form of intrasexual selection. The males are competing amongst one another for access to the females. Silverback gorillas are another example, and that strong sexual dimorphism in size um, is an example. But there are other species than mammals that do this also. Dragonflies are a good example. And sometimes the competition between males is direct. So many species of dragonflies, the males will guard the females. So if you've ever seen flag dragonflies flying in tandem, the male is in the front and the female is in the back. And dragonflies are an interesting example because they possess both direct male-to-male -male competition and indirect competition, which we'll look at here in just a little bit. So the direct competition manifesting in dragonflies is that ma males will guard the females. After she mates with him, he will chase off any rivals and protect her while she's laying her eggs. And so that ensures that those offspring are going to be his and not be fathered by some other male. So that's a direct male-to-male -male competition because males are indirectly fighting with one another or competing with one another uh, to protect and have access to the females. Indirect male-to-male -male competition is, comes in many forms. One of the most common, and one that we've actually already talked about, but in a different context, is the idea, idea of the sneaker male. So here's how it worked. We talked about the beetle example in a previous lecture, but now let's look at a sneaker male example among fish. In some species of fish, the males are large and sexually dimorphic. They're col more uh, colorful and have different behavior than the females. So the large, colorful males will dig a nest and then they will protect it and chase off any other males that come into their their territory. So females then will come in and will mate with the male. It's external fertilization, but they have to have these little nests that are dug out. So female will lay her eggs, the male will guard her against other males and then release his sperm on those eggs and he'll be the father of those eggs. But in this species, a subcategory of males has also evolved. And these subcategory of males called the sneaker male or the satellite male look more like the females. And so they will come in to a male's area and the male, the large colorful male, thinks that he now has more than one mate. And so he's more than happy and uh, willing to let this other individual come in because he thinks it's another female. But it's a, actually a male disguised as the female. And so he will then release his sperm also and some of the eggs in this nest are going to be fathered by him. And so remember, we talked about this in the context of a frequency-dependent selection, and this is actually negative frequency-dependent selection, because the sneaker male or the satellite male strategy only works up to a certain point. Once there are too many sneaker males, it no longer provides a benefit, and so we get a stabilization of that behavior in this population. Okay, but this is also an example of indirect male-to-male -male intrasexual selection, right? Because the males are not directly fighting or competing at something a little bit more subtle. Now back to the dragonfly. There's actually some interesting intersexual, sorry, intrasexual selection, but indirect that occurs in many species of dragonflies. The female has to pick up a sperm packet from the male that he produces at the tip of his abdomen, but then places on a, what is called a secondary uh, sexual structure. It's basically a sp structure that delivers the sperm but it has an additional feature. And this additional feature is a little structure that almost looks like a bottle brush. And before he deposits the sperm in the female reproductive tract, this little structure, bottle brush structure, will reach into that female's reproductive tract and scrape out any sperm that were previously deposited. So it's a way to compete with previous males that have mated with her, but not by directly fighting with them, but by removing the sperm that they may have previously deposited there. And so we get combinations in some species of both direct and indirect intrasexual selection. But if it's competition among one sex, and nearly always that's in the males, then it's intrasexual selection. And this can actually evolve into very, very strange forms, particularly in the right environments. And sometimes this occurs in uh, vertebrates, but very, very commonly in insects. Sperm competition is a form of indirect intrasexual selection 
where males compete with one another, but not by facing off and fighting directly. So some strange examples where males will actually produce blocker sperm, large massive sperm, or in the ejaculate that they release with the sperm, they'll produce a glue that will actually glue up the female's reproductive tract. And so that prevents males that are coming in afterwards mating with her, at least having a very f successful chance of mating, would because her uh, reproductive tract is now blocked up by sperm or blocked up by glue, and so she can't have successful matings. And that's an advantage for those males, and it's a way they compete with other males. And in, when it first arose in the population, it was beneficial for those males, and so it was selected for the males that did it, did better than the males that didn't, and so now it's become very common in those species. But this brings up another interesting dynamic. Sometimes these very pronounced forms of uh, intrasexual selection, when males are competing amongst themselves for access to the females, are great for the male and provide an advantage for the male, but they can be bad for the female. The females may not have the freedom to move about and look for food or to, to look for another male if they don't like the big strong male that's in their area. So that reduces their choices and sometimes reduces their fitness. And so we set up a conflict between the males and the females. And when we have a conflict between males and females, that creates a dynamic that we are going to call, um, well, it's a form of antagonism, where what's good for the males is bad for the females. And that's antagonism. And we're going to talk about antagonism and some other forms of interactions in the next lecture. But this can also be thought of as a form of antagonism or conflict of interest between the sexes. Sometimes it's even termed a sexual arms race. And depending on this dynamic between the males and the females, we might have different outcomes in different habitats. So among some species of birds, we see monogamy, where the male will stay around and help the female to raise the offspring. But in other conditions, in other areas where maybe there are more resources and a single parent can raise the offspring, the males will mate with the female, but then run off, fly off, I guess, and look for more mating opportunities. And that maximizes his ability to reproduce. But it could be bad for the females, and so there's this different dynamic. In some cases, the females will look for more mates, which can be a benefit because then she has more genetically diverse offspring, and females that did that in the past get a benefit, so it's perpetuated. And so we can get different strategies that evolve based on this conflict between what's good for males and good for females. And at some point, depending on the environment, these will balance out. But sometimes it can go to extremes. We can push males to have very extreme behaviors, or we can uh, push females and actually have a detriment to their fitness in other areas, their ability to survive, or the total number of out, out offspring that they can produce because of this strong selection in the males. And then it sets up this very interesting dynamic, which is where this term arms race comes from, where males will evolve a strategy that's good for them, but bad for the females. And then if there's variety amongst the phenotypes in the females, they will respond and actually evolve a resistance to that male behavior. And so they get this back and forth evolution of traits, which will usually eventually balance out, but will sometimes push one sex or the other to an extreme form of behavior. So that's a sexual arms race, and it's a form of antagonistic evolution, where what's good for one part of the population is bad for the other part of the population, and then it goes back and forth and back and forth until it reaches a stable position. And this is actually not unlike the antagonistic interactions that we see between um, parasites and their hosts, where hosts will evolve immunity to the parasite, and then the parasite will evolve increased virulence to get around that immunity, and then back and forth and back and forth, and this will on, go on and on and on, and will often reach a stable point, but sometimes it continues to evolve as one population pushes the other population, and uh, their evolution is driven by characteristics that are found in these different populations. Okay. That's the end of our sexual selection discussion.